Uh, putting an event on like this costs many thousands of dollars, almost ten times the amount that you as an audience paid for admission tonight. This means that the remaining nine-tenths have to be contributed by someone else, uh, by someone who is, to say the least, unusual, someone who is extremely generous and who is also deeply concerned about the well-being of our society. Now, that person tonight is Mr. Robert Gazzardi, who is uh, uh, it's here in our front row, who has taken it on himself to cover the entire expenses of the evening at considerable cost to himself. <laughs> now, Bob Gazzardi is a native Philadelphian, a graduate of St. Joseph's Preparatory School of Georgetown University, where he earned his BA in philosophy and a graduate of Temple University School of Law. Bob believes, he told me, in putting his money where his mouth is. And uh, th this is, uh, well, this is uh, uh, not an easy achievement. I've asked Bob to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Walter Williams. But before he does that, well, I'd like to ask you specifically to give him a round of applause for his generosity tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Burke, and may I say that it is my honor and privilege to support the Winwood Institute, and whatever the cost is, to be able to introduce Dr. Walter Williams is well worth the expense. Uh, Dr. Williams, I have some prepared remarks, but let me just say he is an intellectual celebrity. I'm thrilled to see so many young people here. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody quite appreciates what Dr. Williams uh, does and what he has accomplished but he is able to educate the electorate and educate the, the public on traditional and conservative values. He shared with me a, a short story that years ago when he started out, he gave a, a talk on, on conservative values and liberty, and the following day, Dr. Milton Friedman calls him and says, Do Dr. Williams, you did very well. Uh, one comment, when you speak about liberty, smile. Well, Dr. Williams has been smiling ever since and dis disarming liberals with his charm and winning ways. Uh, as Americans, we are proud to say that we have a free country. Benjamin Franklin famously said that we have a republic if we can keep it. As we have learned in recent years, free societies do not fall from heaven, but have to be constructed out of the earthly material of human nature. Even when they have been created, they do not keep and maintain themselves, but have to be maintained and defended by the constant labors of those who care about them against the threats of those who do not understand them. An important part of that task is military, but another important part of it is intellectual. We need to keep before our eyes what it means to have a free society, why freedom is beneficial for human beings, and what must be done to maintain and preserve it. Without that understanding, our effort loses its meaning. In the history of the United States, some people stand out for their contribution they have made to that intellectual labor. One of them, one of, the, one of their number is Professor Walter Williams. Professor Williams has shown he understands with a consistency and a courage. Few others have demonstrated what it means to have a free society and what the United States especially must do in order to live up to the vision that inspired the founders of this country. In our country, at the very present time, there is a great dispute about the very meaning of a free society, and so there is a great dispute about the role of government. Walter Williams is here tonight to place before us a vision of, that, of our founding fathers and our Constitution about that very subject. Dr. Williams. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank all, thank all of you for coming out tonight. The, uh, the title of my talk is The Legitimate Role of Government in a Free Society. 
Now, in the course of my comments, I'm going to say many things that break with conventional wisdom. I'm going to say things that may sound uh, mean and uncaring, uh, politically incorrect. And I encourage you to raise any kind of question you want during the question answer period. Raise hard questions. Uh, do not feel as though you owe me any undue courtesy because I'm your guest. Um, don't worry about insulting me. I am uninsultable. <laughs> <laughs> the only way you can possibly insult me is suggest I'm not pretty good in basketball. <laughs> and that's a matter of ethnic pride that I take seriously. <laughs> the one of, the, one of the justifications uh, for the growth of government in our country, far beyond what the founders envisioned, uh, is to promote fairness and justice. Uh, that's a worthy goal, but we might also ask, uh, what is fairness and justice? What is a measure of justice? Uh, what is the legitimate role of government in a free society. Let me spend just a few minutes discussing what the founders saw as the legitimate role for the federal government. And to do that, let's turn to the rule book that they gave us, namely the United States Constitution. Most of what the founders saw as the legitimate role for the federal government is found in Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. And let me just briefly quote uh, sections thereof. It says, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and the general welfare of the United States. They have, they're authorized, among these enumerated powers, they're authorized to borrow money on the credit of the United States, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among several states and Indian tribes, to coin money, to establish post office and post roads, to raise and support armies. The framers of the Constitution granted Congress taxing and spending powers for these and a few other activities. Namely, if you read Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, there are about 21 things that Congress is authorized by the Constitution to do. Now, nowhere in the Constitution do we find authority for Congress to tax and spend for up to three quarters of what Congress taxes and spends for today. In other words, there's no constitutional authority for farm subsidies, bank bailouts, food stamps, and not to mention midnight basketball. <laughs> now, some people will say, some people who call themselves, who see themselves as legal scholars, they will say, well, that Williams guy is being very narrow in the strict interpretation of the Constitution. And they'll tell you that the, that the Constitution is a living document. Now, when anyone says that the Constitution is a living document, that is the same as saying we do not have a Constitution at all. That is, for rules of the game to mean anything, the rules must be fixed. Now, to give you an idea, how many of you, after tonight's lecture, would like to play me poker and the rules be living? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is, maybe my two pair, depending on the circumstances, can beat your three of a kind. Now, the framers in their wisdom, they did give us Article 5, as a means to amend the Constitution should the conditions warrant it. Now, I think that we can safely say 
that we made a significant departure from the constitutional principles that made us a rich nation and a prosperous nation in the first place. And to give you an idea of the departure that we've made, consider that, well, most people consider that James Madison is the father of the Constitution. And you kind of guess the father of the Constitution would know what is authorized by the Constitution. In 1794, Congress appropriated $15,000 to help some French refugees escape from, uh, <coughs> provide relief for French refugees who had escaped from what is now Haiti. James Madison stood on the floor of the house irate, and he said, that I cannot undertake to lay my finger on that article of the Constitution that gives Congress the authority to spend the money of their constituents for the purposes of benevolence. And indeed, if you look at Congress spending today, most of it is for the purposes of benevolence, something I'll talk about a little bit later on. Now, the principles of freedom embodied in our nation were embodied through the combined institutions of private property and free enterprise. Some people call it capitalism. Now through numerous successful attacks, private property and free enterprise that the framers envisioned are mere skeletons of their past. And Thomas Jefferson anticipated this when he said, the natural progress of things is for government to gain ground and for liberty to yield. Now the best way of looking at this process of government gaining ground and liberty yielding is to look at what has happened to taxes and federal spending. Now keep in mind a fairly good working definition of taxes is that taxes represent government claims on private property. And if indeed if government were to tax private property at 100%, it would confiscate private property. An even better measure of what government does is to look at what has happened to spending. Let's go back to the turn of the last century, 1902. In 1902, expenditures at all levels of government, federal, state, and local levels of government, totaled $1.7 billion. In that year, the average citizen paid $60 in federal, state, and local taxes. In fact, from 1787 until 1920, except during wartime, federal expenditures were only 3% of the GNP. Today, federal expenditures alone top $2.7 trillion. State and local governments spend over a trillion. The average taxpayer today pays more than $8,000 a year in federal, state, and local taxes, and many of us pay quite a bit more. Now, what's the significance of all this? Well, the significance is that as time goes by, we own less and less of our most valuable property, namely ourselves and the fruits of our labor. Another way of looking at this is that the average taxpayer works from January 1st until May 8th to pay federal, state, and local taxes. 